we started talking about how we started digging into the text of Genesis 1, right? And looking at how Genesis 1 is similar to and yet differs from the Enuma Elish, right? We looked at Genesis 1 through 2, beginning with God creating the world out of what? Water. Water, right? Watery chaos. One fear. Okay. Right, we have watery chaos at the beginning. Right, and what we're going to see is how God is how the text narrates God taking things from chaos to order. Right, we're going to see how that plays out in really interesting ways. Okay, um, and how water is a really good cultural metaphor for the author to use because of how it operates in places like in the Indian Middle East and in other cultures in that time. Okay. So we have uh, everything beginning with this watery chaos. And then what is it that starts bringing that order? What is it that starts creation's process? Wind. And that's good. We've got wind, or breath, or spirit. Right, this word, ruah. Right, in Hebrew. Ura means that just that word, wind, spirit, breath. Yeah, that's that's the thing that hovers over the waters. Right, in Genesis 1, uh, 2. Okay? And then we started laying out, or started seeing a pattern. I asked you guys to look for a pattern to how each of those days of creation are narrated, right? What is, what is that order that we had? I'm going to come over here. Right, so God spoke. Then, right, it is. Right, uh, yeah. God sees it. He affirms it. <coughs> well, that's, so the separating waters are part of one particular day. Right, but as far as the pattern we have, God spoke it, it is, he sees it, he says it's good, and then it says there's evening, there's morning, the whatever day, right? And this is why for Jews, the days begin in the evening. When you fast, you fast from the evening of a particular day to the morning of whatever other day. This is why the Sabbath begins in the evening, right? You have this interesting way that the text is narrating a day, instead of from morning to evening, the text says then there was evening, then there was morning the first day. The one thing that's really interesting about that is what's present, <coughs> it's a really silly rhetorical question, what's present in the morning that's not present in the evening? The sun, sun. sun or light, right? So it's almost, this is almost in itself a movement of creation, right? Of light and of sun being present. So even in how the text is narrating a day, you have creation out of non-creation, right? Light coming out of darkness. So it's a fun little thing there. So there's there's one big pattern that's in the text from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2 and the first part of verse 4 there. <coughs> now let's look at each of these days individually and see how this maps out, right? See how this text kind of works with and against other cultural stories of the time, specifically the Enuma Elish. So, in verses three through five, right? God says, let there be light. So we have day one, we have light and darkness. Right? Um, let there be light. God saw that it was good. Separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And it was evening and it was morning. Now, one thing that you see here is God calls something day and calls something night. Naming is typically considered a divine activity. Right? Or even when it's not a divine activity, it is a very meaningful activity. Whenever something is named, 
right? You are giving it its purpose. Um, if we look at the Enuma Elish, we have, when on high, the heaven had not been named, right? Or, it's, or other translations say, when nothing had been named, right? And then Lamu and Lahamu were brought forth by name they were called, right? Naming is incredibly significant for the ancient Near East. It gives something its purpose. It gives something its trajectory. You typically, when you name something, you are saying, I have authority over it. Okay? So when God names things in this text and in the Enuma Elish, there's a certain power over that thing once you have named it. Okay? And it's also, it's a creative thing as well. You are creating, right? This is why, um, you know, the text, these texts such as, such as the Enuma Elish, have the heavens and the earth being named, right? And why in the in the Genesis account, God names things day and night, which mirrors what mothers do to children and what fathers do to children, right? You name children when they come into being. This is kind of the cosmic version of that, right? So naming is hugely significant here. We also have here the theme of separating or separation. Separating is another way in ancient Near Eastern myths where, or it is a means by which things or gods come into existence. Okay. Um, sorry, you say it's sorry, separating what? means coming into an existence? It's, it's a means by which things come into existence. For example, um, the world is created by the separating of the waters, okay. right? We have God here creating the cosmos by separating light and dark. Um, there, are, there are other ancient Near Eastern myths where you have gods that come about through the separation of another god. Okay, so separating is another huge theme. And we see here in Genesis, we see kind of the, the cultural um, traces of this ancient Near Eastern um, theme, right, of naming, of separating. These are very creative activities for the ancient Near East. And like we said, we have that evening morning. So even in how it's narrating these days, there's that shift from darkness to light, right? That act of creating right in the text itself. Did I see a hand? No. Okay. Awesome. So the next thing that happens, verses 6 through 8, talk about, and here we get to what I think you said earlier, we have this separation of the waters, right? So day two... separation of the waters. And actually, I'm going to write here we have um, sky and I'll say waters. Right? And if I can kind of quickly find it here, I can show you the place in the Enuma Elish where it talks about Marduk separating Tiamat. Let's see here. It's which tablet am I? Tablet two. So it hadn't been named from it yet. It was just sky and waters. Um, let's see here. God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters. Let us separate the waters. So God made the dome. Um, and God called the dome sky. Okay. Right? So God names it sky even there, right? That act of naming. So this one did the purpose. Yeah, you're kind of giving it this this identity. Yeah, for sure. Let's see. Is this okay? Here we go. So arteries severing those. Okay. Then the Lord paused to view her dead body that he might divide the form and do artful works. Right? Marduk's doing artful works, or doing art with her body. Um, he split her like a shellfish into two parts, half of her he set up as a covering for heaven pulled down the bar and posted guards, he made them not allow the waters to escape. Right? This creating of that space between and making it such that those waters don't come back in. What's interesting is when we get to the flood, we'll see how this idea of the waters being separate comes full circle to where those waters are allowed to then come back together. Right? But we'll get there. 
So here in the Enuma, we just idea of separating the waters, right? And we see the Hebrew text kind of coming out of that cultural way of thinking, that cultural worldview. Good. So it was later on that it, it, that it got named Firmament? Sky, sky and Firmament. Firmament's like the nice uh, King James. Like, I'm being fancy with my language. Okay, that's firmament, that's right? The sky and Firmament. Um, the word that's being used here is the same word for heaven. Right, in Hebrew, it's heaven and heavens. Right, good. Now, what happens, what do we get on day three? Right, so if we are gathering the water in different places, what's created then is land. Right, yeah, we've got dry land now. Right, and, and uh, we get some nice shrubbery along with the land, right? So in day three, we get this nice dry land coming up. All right, so, so there's that new space created, right? And it's interesting, too, because if we read a little bit further in this, it does talk about how uh, Marduk it does the same, right? There's the first separation of the waters, and then there's the creation of dry land once those waters have been separated. Now... What's next? Mice. Does anybody remember a few classes ago? Um, we'll say cosmic lights here. <coughs> Why it says <coughs> lights, the greater and the lesser light? What's that? Lesser is the lesser. The lesser is the moon, the greater is the sun. Why doesn't it just say sun and moon? It does, it does. But the people wouldn't know that. If you said sun, people wouldn't know well, that one gives off more light. Mm -hmm. Why does the text not say sun? Do you right now? It be a double meaning. Yeah, there's a double meaning there. <laughs> a meaning they want to avoid. The word in Hebrew for sun it's Shemesh, a ancient Near Eastern sun god. If you don't have vowels, you're not going to want to mention that God's creating another god, right? You don't want any confusion, right? And the same thing happens with the word for moon. So that's well, why the text. The E's and the A's, right? So one is Shemesh with E's and one's Shamash with A's, right? But like we looked at with that Hebrew text, originally it didn't have any vowels, right? So orally transmitting that might have been easy. You just say Shemesh and it's fine, but once you start writing this down, you're going to want to avoid some confusion, right? So that's why the text just says greater and lesser lights, right? So that nobody has any confusion. We have one God doing all the creating, right? What's one thing that we've noticed too? How violent is this story so far? Very. No, no, sorry, no. not this one. This oh. one. Uh, yeah, oh. non-violent. Not violent at all, right? <clears throat> and not only is it affirmed that this is, or is it kind of implied that this is a very unviolent creation, but we have every time here God saying this is a good thing, yeah. right? This isn't something creative created out of a dead God's body. Right, this isn't some vanquished foe, um, and man isn't referred to as savages when God creates them. Right, everything is affirmed as good. Right, so here you have a very different worldview. Right, a very different idea of the cosmos and humanity's place in it, as compared to how the Enuma Elisha is doing it. So you see here, despite these similarities that we're pointing out, the huge kind of differences that the text is kind of putting along the way. It's the same thing as if we had, you know, like we we're talking about. Uh, go to like shoot the bears, right? It's the same story, but you alter one little thing and you're gonna have a huge difference in meaning. Okay, and that's kind of what this text is starting to do, is show us how different those are, or how different these perspectives are. Now looking here too, what's interesting, um, let me see here. This is verse 14 through 19 that we're looking at. What's the purpose of these, these astral signs? Right, these great lights. 
Tell the different seasons? Good, what else? They're just, what does it say? Let me signs for seasons, for days, and for years, right? So we have here a guy kind of setting up a calendar via these signs. You're setting up signs so that humans can make a calendar, right? These things are marking out seasons, years, days, right? You can kind of plot these things out. Look here at tablet five of the Enuma Elish. He constructed stations for the great gods, fixing their astral likenesses as the stars of the zodiac. He determined the year and the sections. He divided it. He set up three constellations for each of the 12 months. After defining the days of the year by means of heavenly figures, he found the stations of the pole star, uh, determined their balance that none might error or go astray. Right? So here in the same sense, you have Marduk kind of setting up the calendar via these stars, via these astral lights. Right? And the same thing is kind of happening here in our creation myth. Okay. Now there's a little, this goes into a little bit more detail um, about how Marduk kind of sets up, um, sets up the calendar, whereas it seems in Genesis kind of how the, um, the times of years for festivals and things like that and religious festivals aren't orchestrated by God. That's kind of left to man to do. Um, but there's still this kind of setting up of a calendar via these lights. Right? And it's interesting too that you notice that these lights are ruling in the same way that the gods have their astral likenesses, right? And let's see, which verse is that? 16, God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, right? <clears throat> Again, because we have this language, just one more reason that we're gonna wanna make sure that you don't think these are gods ruling each of these different light dominions. Oops, let's see, that's a really weird feature. Good, okay. What comes next? Birds. 20 through 23. Birds, disease, creatures. Good. <clears throat> five. Birds and sea creatures. What does God tell these birds and sea creatures to do? Good. Be fruitful and multiply. Good. That's, that's a, a phrase we'll see come back up. So there's this blessing, there's this blessing and this um, commission, right, to creation. Creation has a purpose here. Fruitful, multiply, and fill. Good. Finally, well not finally yet, quite. Day six. Land and animal, uh, land animals and humanity. Good. Inter isn't it interesting that humans don't get their own day here? Right? Mm. We are lumped right in with the animals. With the animals. <laughs> and it's only after humans are created that there's, again, this, this blessing. Right? Kind of further emphasizing that we are, in a sense, lumping humanity in with mm -hmm. land animals. Right? There's almost, in this account, nothing all that special about humans. Right? They, 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 they share a day, and they get the same blessing that the birds and the sea creatures do. <laughs> right? They're not that special in this, in this story. Right? And then finally, what's day six? Or day seven, sorry. Rest. 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 Good. Now, what's something you notice about, and I know it might be kind of hard for some of you to see, this board's kind of skewed. Um, what's something interesting about how these days are laid out? Not this order. What kind of order can you see that's going on there? How so? Well, you need light. Well, God would light. Well, it's interesting too because we have light before we have the sun and the moon. Oh, yeah. Sorry. You gotta see it. You gotta see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody starts like you know making a workbench in the dark. That's fair. Yeah, it's it's dark. Dark. Huh? Yeah, well, no, that's good. Notice here, each of these, there's separation, right? We separate the light and the dark. We separate the sky and the water. We separate the wet and the dry. He's 
given, I guess, each part, like you said, an identity before he. Yeah. There's a problem. If you draw a column, you know, you like right here? Dark. No, I'm just saying like for each one. So if you have a light and dark, uh -huh. and then you have sky and water uh -huh. and land and, and like oceans. Right. Like, land and vegetation. So it's like well. a part of, in that column, each column is going to have. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. I'm going to erase this just because it'll kind of throw us off a little bit. Because what's really important in, in three, dry land is created through like the, um, you know, the, the separating that off from the oceans. But it's it's important here that we keep oceans specifically in day two. But the herbs and the, the trees and all that was the same day, right? Yeah. So the, the, the dry land and the vegetation, like all that's kind of created right there, right? It's like kind of a, a home is being created here. Because notice what happens. We get light and darkness on day one. Day four, we put the things in the light and the darkness. Okay. The sky and the waters, we put the things in the sky and the waters. Oh. Day six, land animals and humans, we put them in the home that we've created for them. Oh, yeah. And then the seventh day, you rest. Right? There's that rest. Right? This is... This is the author purposefully narrating this thing this way for a very theological purpose, right? It does not matter to the author that it doesn't make sense that you can't have light without the sun. That doesn't matter for the author. What matters for the author is this kind of thematic order. Because what we are coming out of, remember, come over here, is this void this nothingness, this place that is no home, and we are coming into oops, order in which everything has place and purpose. Right. The purpose of the cosmic lights is for the season. The purpose of the birds in the sea and the land animals and the humans is to be fruitful, to multiply and to fill. Everything has place and purpose, right? We have moved from void and chaos to place and purpose. And this is how this author has constructed this creation narrative, right? And on the seventh day here, we have rest, right? Now the verb to rest in Hebrew is a language none of you can read, which is totally fine, <laughs> is Shabbat. What does Shabbat sound like? Sabbath. Sabbath. Ooh. That's not accidental. Mm -hmm. Right? The word for Sabbath is derived from the word to rest, to cease, to stop. Right? And so not only do we have this cosmic order, but we also have cosmic grounds for the practice of Sabbath, right? The practice of Sabbath is not this extra thing that human religion has put in place, so claims the author of this text, but this is cosmically designed, right? It is written into the very fabric of existence that there is this day of rest. So for Jews traditionally, it's Sabbath. It's sorry, it's Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, it changed to Sunday with Christians with Christianity. Yeah, and there's a whole history behind that. So, that's a good question. So originally, for Jews, it was it was Saturday. Yeah. Um, Are we going to talk about why it changed, or is that New Testament? That's what's well, kind of New Testament. It's also a little, little bit of history. It's not quite relevant to where we're at. You can look it up, or you know, if you if, tell you what, if, if anybody wants to look it up, you can, we can bring it up. You can present it on uh, Friday. Well, the main reason was like they didn't they didn't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday back then, right? Well, they weren't called those days. Those are names derived from you know a whole but, other. But they just place. had seven days. Yeah, they were called. They were called. They had names of their own, but they weren't called Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. Those, those come, I think, from Rome. Yeah. Um, now, 
thinking back to the question we had on the board, which author, J, E, D, or P, would be most concerned with this movement of going to chaos to order, to place and purpose, and would be interested in kind of cosmically justifying the practice of Sabbath? J. J. Can we get hands for J? The Yahwist. What about hands for the Eloist? Hands for priests? Hands for Deuteronomist? Okay. It's going to be the priestly source. I don't accept that. I think some of y'all were just voting for what you put down. You're like, I don't care what he said. That's what I said. Actually, in the book, I mean, it just tells how much it had to do with creation. So that's why I said J. That's, I mean, that's fair. Um, but this, it also, in the books, I think, repeatedly talks about how the priestly source is involved in this. You know, and the priestly source is going to be very much interested in saying, like, look, I'm not making this up. This is just the order of things. Right? Right. And the same thing, when, if any of you go to a religious service, right, religious services have order. Right? Even in the most <coughs> whatever, there is typically some kind of order of worship, right? There's some kind of practice, right? The welcoming and the greeting and a song and then a reading and a song and a sermon or whatever, right? There's some kind of order there, right? And and the priestly source is going to be is going to want to say that this is that this is a cosmic thing, right? That remember when we talked about microcosms about the temple being a microcosm of the cosmos, right? So the same kind of order that is taking place with the priest and with the religious practices is mirroring as a microcosm of the cosmic order, right? Great. So this is, this is our first creation account, right? And kind of going quickly through those major themes that we set up at the beginning, who is God, who is humanity, um, what is, the, cre what is uh, the world like, and what's the relationship between God and humans. As compared to the Anima Elish, God is what? How, how would you classify God according to Genesis 1 here? Is, is like creator, right? How does he create? Speaking, right? So nonviolent, right? Very, we could say transcendent, um, not very anthropomorphic. Um, what? How would you? How would you talk about creation? Organized, organized, right? Orderly, right? And in the same way that creation is organized, right? How many of you are messy? Messy, just generally messy human beings. A couple, right? Does your room look messy or does your room look clean? Right. So some people try to keep stuff organized for other people. Right? But if you, if you are a messy person, typically, typically your space is messy. So what we're also getting here is because, because creation is orderly, so too is the creator. Right? So we can read from how the narrator is talking about things being created onto the character of God that he is trying to portray, right? So God is orderly as well because what he has created is orderly, okay? It's kind of what the text is implying here. Uh, how do we talk about humans in this text? <coughs> huh? And, and, and just Genesis 1? Huh? Huh? Not too much. Nothing really special. Part of creation. But they're a part of creation. Are they good or bad? Good. 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 Right. God looks at it and says this is good. Right. And they and they receive a blessing. Right. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Right. Very different from, uh, you know, what, what did it call humanity here? Servants. Savages. Savages. Right. They are. They are servants. You're, you're exactly right. They are servants. But they're explicitly referred to as savages. Right. Very different kind of view of humanity. And what in this text, or sorry, in, in Genesis, is the relationship of humanity to God, or humanity to creation? Right. Well, yes. Is that, is that in this one? Yes. Good. Created in his image. Good. 
really important little little note here with that phrase in his image. There's a lot of philosophizing and, and um, theologizing about what that means and some good stuff can come out of there. What that likely meant to the original audience was that humanity is the only legitimate image of God, i.e. not idols. Right? Idols are these images through which you can worship God. Right? They aren't they aren't the they aren't the God, but they are the image of God. So in a sense, what Genesis is here saying, this first version of the creation story, is that the only legitimate image of God is humanity. Right? Which again would help make sense of why this is likely the priestly source, because here we have within the creation story, um, this idea of the sin of idolatry. Does that have anything to do with the, the pictures that they say he looks like? What do you mean? I mean, when you see a picture, well, I don't believe Like if someone was to ask, what do you think God looks like? And say, well, it looks like me because I was made in his image. Um, well, what's interesting here is with, I mean, with the, with the text, it's saying humanity is made in God's image. So there is no, like, one single yeah, I'm just saying that the question will be the same for everyone. The answer will be the same for everyone, but if they would wonder what does he look like, it would be like all of us because we're made in his image. In a sense, yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to kind of like push the audience away from assuming that there is any one image. Right. Right. Because there is this multiplicity. Yeah. But there is a general image. If you stand in a doorway with a light behind you, what's the image you see? The shadow. Two arms. Two legs, you know, a general form. I yeah. Guess. And it gives some description in some Bibles that I read there. Yeah. Of what God looks like? Yeah. Hair of wool. Jeez. A little bit. You got the, the Ancient of Days idea that comes from one book in the Old Testament. So, but the, the main purpose of this, this past, of, of how this is probably intended, is to say that you cannot create an image of God. You cannot create an image of Yahweh. Right. You can't even say his name. You can't even say his name. <laughs> right. Okay, good. I, I realize that I am kind of like, I shouldn't say it. I know. Fine. I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. Good. Um, a little thing, though, what is kind of interesting, and we'll see it much more in uh, the second story, is that the roles of God and humanity are a little flipped from how they are in the Enuma Elish. In the Enuma Elish, right, humans are created to care for the gods, right? In this story, God has pretty much created a space so that humanity can flourish, right? And have dominion over, right? Exactly. And they have dominion in the same way that the cosmic lights do, right? So, so there's this, this kind of flip, whereas human, humanity is not created to care for the creator, right? Humanity, like in a, in a, in a kind of more radical sense, you have God creating a place because he cares for his created being. <coughs> right? Good. Now, let's look at the second story. Let's pull over to uh, two. And interesting, and interestingly enough, I'm not sure what the rationale for splitting this chapter where it's split, because uh, it hits right in the middle of a verse. But the second creation account picks up in the second part of verse 4 in chapter 2. Okay. Let's see what all I'm going to erase. Can I erase this? Is this okay? Okay. Can somebody read, if they have our lovely NRSV version um, that I hope most of you are looking at, uh, the first, say, uh, let's see how far. Um, let's see, three, or that four B through six. Somebody could just start reading that. would be great. So just second half, just in, in the day that the Lord God made. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant or of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not called its rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. And then the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Perfect. And then became a living being. Okay, perfect. And then became a living being. Good. What do we start with in this story? What's the beginning of creation in this story? Uh, further back than that. Created the heavens and the earth. Right. The heavens and earth. So it, it says in the day that he did this. Uh -huh. Good. No plants or anything. No plants or anything. Yeah. Right. What is the only thing that it seems like is there? Water. water. It does say that a stream would rise and water would. From the earth. Yeah. <coughs> We've got instead of a watery chaos this time. Mm -hmm. We've got dry land, right? We've got a desert. This is a really big metaphor in the Hebrew Bible, the desert wilderness, right? It comes up a lot. Right? So in the second account, we don't have this watery chaos from which we are, you know, going to be creating order. In this account, we are starting with this desert, and there is a desert because there's no one to till or to keep the land, right? Um, see here, because there's no one to till the ground, right? This word for to till means to um, care for. Care for, serve, right, work, right? Think of the way that um, like a hospice worker like works with somebody, but in working with them, they're caring for them. Right? The way that farmers work the land, but in, in a sense, they are caring for it. They are making sure that that land is able to produce crops. Right? So nothing has been created yet because there's no one to keep it. There's no one to care for it. Okay? So we have, in this sense, what, is, what, are we, what can we already tell is of prime importance in this narrative? Or who? The humans, right? This is a very, we can use a fun word here, anthro, right? Remember anthropomorphic, human form? This is a very anthropocentric, human-centered narrative, right? It's not until humans get created, remember here we have <coughs> humans being the first thing formed, then God formed man from the dust of the ground. Now, oh lordy, always time, always time. Let's see here. Oh, I've got to go to the next chapter here. Something interesting that your text pointed out that I would also like to harp on. Let's see if that's going to work. Aha. Okay, this is a nice little fun tool. I'll teach you how to use it later when we get there. But the word for man in Hebrew, Adam, or Adam, right? Adam simply means human. It can sometimes mean man, but it is more accurately translated to human, right? Fun thing, the word for ground, Adama. God takes Adam from Adama, right? We have here like a, a, uh, a earth creature, a ground creature, right? This thing made from the earth, right? And that's what even the text says explicitly. God formed man from the dust <coughs> of the ground, right? Adam comes from Adama, right? So the word Adam isn't really used as a proper pronoun until a little bit later. Right, but it's the same exact word. Okay, you can kind of tell it's different in the text because it puts, um, see the Lord God formed. Uh, it says the here, the man. Right, and, this, and we know so we know to translate this Adam as human, right? In the same way that you wouldn't say, you know, the Shirley or the Sam or the Max or whatever. Right? You wouldn't usually put a, an article, a definite article, before somebody's name. So. so, yeah, so here we have humans being created um, from, from the dust. Okay? Um, but notice here, in this one, is, is humanity created in God's image? No. no. Right? 
Because that this isn't coming from a priestly perspective, this go around. Right? So do we right. think two people wrote this? Is yeah, these are likely two different sources, oh. two different traditions that are being brought together. <laughs> yeah, because they have two very different concerns, two very different outlooks, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, think about uh, from a New Testament perspective, you have four different Gospels yes. because they're all written to four different groups mm -hmm. and have very different concerns. Um, in our modern culture, we typically don't value maintaining different traditions if they disagree with each other. We're like, no, we need to figure out what the true story is, what is factually accurate. And so if we have multiple stories, we'll do our research and see which ones, or what parts of each are more, the most accurate, and we'll kind of weld them together into one. What did you click inside the blue letter Bible to get to this part? Tools. This tool? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've got a few more minutes. Don't start packing up on me yet. I'm sorry, I was just putting my tablet. Oh, it's okay. So yes, we, we have two. That's okay. We have two very different accounts here, and we need to make sure that we kind of understand that they're two, so that we don't lose the concerns of one in trying to make it with the other. Right? We can very clearly see the the purposes of each when we let them be their own story. Okay. So let's see here. Um, but what's interesting? How is man is formed and and. There's, there's something at work in chapter 2 that was at work in chapter 1. What's that same kind of creative force that's at work again here in chapter 2? Breath. Breath. Oh. Right? We've got that breath coming back. Right? That creative force. Right? That creative breath is at work in this story in the same way it was before. 